you have your Bibles this morning, please turn to Acts chapter 2. The book of Acts chapter 2. This morning we are continuing a series. It's a little bit of a break from the Gospel of Mark. Uh, but we will return to the Gospel of Mark in a few weeks. But last week we launched a series as we are preaching through our membership covenant. Now I know this would not top the chart of seeker-friendly, attractive sermon series It's going to draw in the masses from the community. But I will tell you that maybe if you're visiting Friendship Southern Baptist and maybe if you're considering joining Friendship Southern Baptist, this is a little bit of a get-to-know-you exercise because before you join somewhere, you want to know what is expected of you. I started dating my wife when I was 15. And after six years, I was 21 and she's finally like, you know, baby, if you like it, you got to put a ring on it. <clears throat> and so, uh, like, okay. And so I called up her father and said, uh, Mr. Roof, I need to come meet with you. He's like, oh, yeah, do you want to go out to dinner with uh, you and Tyler? And I'm like, no, Tyler won't be there. And he's like, really? Something wrong? He's like, no, I just need to come have a meeting with you. So before I asked my wife to marry me, to be my fiancé, I went over to ask permission from her father. And when I came there, listen guys, I was so, so nervous. If you've ever heard me tell stories about my father-in-law, you probably understand why. And so he had prepared uh, this nice tray of appetizers. Literally, he had this plate full of cookies. And I guess he thought Tyler was coming with me anyway. I'm not sure, but there was so much food. And so I explained that I, I, I said, Mr. Roof, I want to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage. And he said, okay, well, how do you plan to take care of her? I said, well, I'm going to be a preacher. He said, what else? I said, that's all I got right now. And so anyway, we had an interview for three hours of me explaining how I was going to take care of his daughter before he gave her hand in marriage. And I was so nervous that whole time. I didn't know it, but I ate that entire plate of cookies. I mean, I'd just be answering questions sitting there. All the cookies were gone. Uh, So if you ever have that, make a plate of cookies, and hopefully the young man will have a little eating therapy while that's going on. But it was important before he allowed me to join his family and her to join my family, that he found out everything that I had planned and what my expectations were and what his expectations were. And that's what this is today. As we preach through our membership covenant, this is simply saying, if you want to be a part of friendship, here's our expectations. And if you think these are unrealistic expectations, well, go to a place where they don't have expectations. Because here we expect something of people. We expect you to fulfill your potential as a Christian in the body of Christ. Before we read our scripture, I want to show this graph up on the screen. Recently, the Pew Research Foundation did a survey of why Americans go to church. Now, they could select more than one option, but here's a few of the options. The the top option was to become closer to God, which I think there's some merit in that. We want to... uh, seek God, we want to pursue God, but there also may be a little bit of a man-centered salvation. I'm not sure about the context. Some people think that you have to go earn God's grace through doing things. So, for example, in the Catholic background, the way you are saved is by applying grace to you through the sacraments. And that in order to remove your sin, you have to atone for your own sin through the sacraments. So some people think that I must go to church to earn my salvation. I don't know the context, but that was the number one answer. The second answer is so children will have a moral foundation. I like that answer. I don't think it's the government's job or the school system's job to teach morality because morality is not founded in science. Morality is founded in God's revelation. And parents, it should be our job. Listen, the school is not going to teach your kids right and wrong they're going to teach them science history and math you got to teach them what's right in life that's our job and at the church when we preach from the word of god we understand what morality is thirdly it says to make me a better person now this is where it kind of starts going downhill 
Because church cannot make you a better person. Some people think they're going to put on their pink tie and their vest and they're going to come look shiny and it's going to make them better. All right? But here's the thing. Going to church does not improve your condition. The only thing that improves your condition is faith in Jesus Christ and that His, His blood has covered your sin. That is the only thing that takes a dead sinner and brings them to life. Now, once you are brought to life by the Holy Spirit, then the Holy Spirit plugs you into the church so that you can serve the community and serve others. But going to church doesn't make you a better person. Some people think uh, church is like a self-help, self-improvement th type thing where I'm going to go and, and overcome my problems, etc., etc. Unfortunately, too many people associate getting better with church attendance rather than Jesus Christ. And going down the list, some people say, I go to church because I found the, the sermons valuable. I won't argue there. I think you're valuable too. Um, to be a part of a community of faith. I think that's a good, good reason to go to church, to be with others in the faith community. Now, that answer could come from a Muslim or a Mormon just the same. But there's one thing missing on this list, which I think is the primary reason that we attend church. And it doesn't appear here. And that is because God is worthy of worship. Amen? Why do I go to church? All these reasons are self-man-centered reason. Because I want to be closer. Because I want to be better. Because I want comfort. Because I find value. Because I want to be in a community. Etc, etc, etc. None of these are God-based reasons. Because God is worthy of worship. And what happens is when we see the worth and the value of God and we come to church to worship God because He is worthy and He is valuable, then it is that bedrock of salvation that is the cohesive glue that keeps the church together. Because whenever I fail or whenever you fail, if the bedrock of our glue is based on one another, then the church is not cohesive. But if the bedrock is the worth of Jesus Christ then I can forgive other people, I can love other people, I can serve other people, even people that I don't like. I can serve them because what makes me come here is not other people, what makes me come here is Christ. Amen, church? So we can clear that, we can turn our attentions to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to begin in verse 40, if you're there, say word. Now this context here is that it's the beginning of the church, and this situation is Pentecost. This was a Jewish festival where Jews from all over the known, uh, uh, known world at the time had gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. And at this event, the disciples were in an upper room. They were praying for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit came down upon them. And they spoke in other tongues. And everyone heard them in their own language. And Peter was preaching to them about believing in Jesus Christ. So we pick up in verse 40. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then, those who had received his word were baptized, and that day there were about 3,000 souls added to their number. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and sharing with each one, as anyone might have need, day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. They were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. May God bless the reading of his word. What we find here is three definitions of the church. Number one, who was in the church? It was those who believed. It says in verse 44, all those who believed were together and had all things in common. There's a reason in Baptist churches, the only people who are baptized are the ones who have professed faith in Christ. It's because the members of the church are the ones who believe. And those who don't believe are not members of the church. Uh, I, for one, affirm total depravity. Uh, if not for one reason, it's because I have a mayor. And I believe that mayor is not yet regenerate. And he is not part of the covenant community until God changes his heart. 
So in the church were those who believed. And what were they doing? It says in verse 42, they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And thirdly, who was doing it? It says in verse, uh, I believe, 47, that the Lord was adding to their number those who were being saved. So we see who was in the church. It was those who believed. What were they doing? They were studying the scriptures, praying together, fellowshipping together, communing together, sharing everything together. And three, who was doing it all? Behind the scenes, it was God who was doing it. So this morning, we're going to keep that frame of context as we talk about what does it mean to be part of the local church. If you're taking notes today, I encourage you to. We're going to look at these aspects of church membership. And last week, we covered the first two. I'll touch them briefly. We expect members to be worshiping members. Worshiping members. In our uh, membership covenant, it says, I recognize that Sunday is the Lord's day, and this day is reserved for the corporate gathering of the body for worship and preaching God's word. God has designed the Sabbath day so that on the Sabbath day, we are able to put aside our schedule and our plans and our life, and all our agendas must come crashing to a halt so that God might be preeminent in our schedule, in our time, and in our life. God has designed that one in every seven days, everything you want to do goes on hold for a minute. See, there's things we all could be doing right now. We all could be at home doing laundry. We could all could be at home cutting the grass. We all could be at home watching whatever sports thing is on right now. But see, on the Lord's day, our agendas are pushed to the back burner so that God is preeminent on this day. And that's not only something that's in our church covenant. That's something that's in the Baptist confession to historically realize that God has created a Sabbath day for spiritual rest and physical rest. Have you ever, how many of you have ridden in an airplane before? Pretty good percentage of you guys. You know, when they talk about the oxygen masks, if the oxygen in the cabin depletes for a reason, if it's not pressurized, the oxygen mask will drop down. And when they give you the instructions or you look at the booklet, it says, if you have children with you, put your mask on first before you help other people. Because if the mask drops down, there's no oxygen in the cabin, and you're helping little Billy and little Bobby and little Susie, and suddenly you pass out. You're not going to be any good because you've focused on other people. So what they tell you to do is put the oxygen mask on first and then help everybody else. See, the thing is, if you're not breathing, you can't help other people breathe. That's going to preach. Y'all ain't even got it right yet. See, if you haven't filled yourself up by, by investing in what you need to be spiritually full and spiritually content, if you don't have joy, peace, and contentment in Christ, how can we help other people find it? The answer is we can't. See, we've got to put the mask of worship on first before we can help other people be a worshiper. Secondly, we're supposed to be active members. Active members. Our covenant says, I will be a regular attender of the worship meetings of the church, including Sunday morning services and not limited to Wednesday night prayer meetings. If I cannot attend for a period of time, I will notify my pastor, deacon, and Sunday school teacher just like if I were to miss a period of time at work. I want to tell you something I love. I love when people are going to be gone on a trip or vacation, and they come up to me and they say, Pastor, I'm going to be gone for the next two weeks or three weeks. I love that because when they're not here, I know I have not offended them, okay? I know they, they, they didn't disagree with something that I said in the sermon. But I love that. And sometimes people, maybe you go visit the grandkids in Florida, you do something like that. Listen, just let somebody know. Because we know where you sit. And we look for you. And when you let somebody know, just like if you were to miss work or if you were to miss uh, uh, from some important function that you had, it's expressing an expectation that people are looking for you to be here and people expect you to be here. I read this week that 35% of professed Christians in the United States, 35% are the ones that attend church on Sunday. That means that 65% of professed Christians do not attend church on Sundays. Now imagine how that would work in other organizations. Imagine if when the Panthers play, only 35% of the team show up. I mean, you got the wide receivers and the running back, 
But the kicker, he didn't show up. Quarterback didn't show up. Offensive lineman didn't show up. Are they going to get very far? No, by no means. What if they did that in the medical profession? Imagine you show up for surgery and only 35% of the hospital staff show up. Well, sir, I understand today we've got to do a uh, L5 and L6 vertebrae reconstruction. And unfortunately, the anesthesiologist uh, had to do laundry. So he won't be in today. Good luck. What if your house was on fire and only 35% of firefighters showed up for work that day? Here they come. They got a hose. But the guys that drive the truck, they were on vacation. They didn't let nobody know. <laughs> your house is going to burn up real quick. You see, if 100% of Christians claim Christ, why don't they claim Christ's church? It's because we've existed in a culture where people have isolated Christianity to the individual level to think that they can belong to Christ but not belong to Christ's church. Here's one thing I've said several times. We are not saved by the church, but we are saved into the church. When God saves you, he saves you into his covenant community. He saves you into his church so that you can belong to the church. You can serve in the church. We must understand that Christianity is our profession. It is what we do, and it comes before all other professions. Your job will change. Your location will change. Your friends and family at some point may change, and all that is external, but your profession as a Christian will never change. It comes before everything else. It is our primary duty, and God has designed the church so that our Christian life will flourish by being plugged into the church. Thirdly, we expect people to be disciple-making members. Jesus said in Matthew 28, 19, Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations. He was not telling that to the spiritual elite. He was telling that to the normal working class, tax collectors, fishermen, and, and blue-collar workers. The job of making disciples is not reserved for the seminary graduates or the, the theological degrees. The job of making disciples is for every single person who claims the name of Christ. I need about five Baptists to say amen on that. If there's something Baptists have historically been about, we've been about the Great Commission, amen? We've been about taking the gospel to every creature, not just the comfortable creatures, not just the creatures that we like. Well, I'm talking about every creature. And right now, we have 4,000 missionaries through the Southern Baptist Convention in every continent, every country, sharing the good news. They might be in Antarctica, I don't know. Somebody needs to be down there, amen? See, the mission statement of our church is to equip families and individuals to make disciples in their community and throughout the world. We want you to make disciples because we believe that is the responsibility of a Christian. So how do we do that? Number one, you have to be a disciple. Number two, you have to make disciples. All right, the first way is you have to be a disciple. That means you have to get plugged in to some discipleship arm of the church. I was so encouraged this morning. We had four new couples in Sunday school this morning. I love see people, seeing people getting plugged into discipleship where they're going to sharpen the word. They're going to sharpen themselves. Iron sharpens iron. One man sharpen another. And that's what happens in Sunday school. We dialogue through the scripture. We wrestle with it. We say, you know what? My wife is co-teaching with me right now. And sometimes she'll say, I don't agree with that. And I'll say, honey, you can be wrong. Okay. That's what happens in Sunday school. We wrestle together with it. And some of you really don't know if I'm serious, but I'm going to leave it a mystery. Okay? We have to be plugged into some sort of discipleship arm. You see, the word disciple is taken from the root word, which means to be a learner. Everyone can learn something. You learn what you're passionate about. I don't mind telling you guys this. We live in Concord. I have developed a recent uh, affinity for firearms. Just been spent 12 years in the military. I'm familiar with firearms. I like them. Go hunt ducks sometimes, hunt deer sometimes. I said hunt, didn't kill, but go hunt sometimes. And I just enjoy them. So I like getting up on YouTube. Sometimes I look up uh, uh, videos on, on people doing accurate shooting or long-range shooting and stuff like that. And the key is, whatever you're interested in, you're going to learn about. All right? But our primary interest, above all things, should be Christ. 
And if we're interested in Christ, if we love and have an affection for Christ, we're going to learn about him. And we're not going to say, eh, I just want to learn a bit about him. Just a little bit. Now we're going to learn all we can about Christ. So we have to be disciple-making members. We have to learn so that we can teach others. Fourth, we expect members to be a giving member. In our church covenant, it says, I understand that the ministries of the church are supported by the weekly tithes and offerings, and the pastoral staff supports their families through, the gift, through these gifts. Because of this, I pledge to honor and support the ministries of the church by being a regular, cheerful, and sacrificial giver. One time a fellow had been visiting the church for a few months and we went out to lunch and he looked at me and he says, so what do you do for your real job? And I said, what do you mean? He says, well, you know, how do you support your family when you're not preaching? And I'm like, this is how I support my family. Some people don't know that. Some people don't realize that preachers have a full-time job of overseeing the ministries of the church. Now, sometimes I'll joke when we take up the offering and I'll say this morning we're going to collect the offering for hungry children. Their names are Roman, Bella, and Mayer. But there's a lot of truth to that. I mean, look at Bella. She, she needs to pack on a little bit. Okay? <laughs> Honey, mommy's on drill today, so we're going to have carb up mac and cheese. Okay? Bread, all the good stuff. But in reality, not everyone knows that the pastors make their full-time profession through the ministry of the church. In 1 Corinthians 16, 2, it says, On the first day of every week, each one should set aside a sum of money in keeping with your income, saving it up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. What that means is, those who make a lot can give a lot. And those who make a little can give a little. When we give our offering, it is an act of worship to bless God for how He has already blessed us. We do not give our offering so that God will then make us rich. We give our offering because we have already been made rich through Jesus Christ. The Bible never says that God's going to meet all your wants according to Jesus Christ. He says God will meet your needs according to the riches of Jesus Christ. Now I wish I could stand up here today and say if you give your, if you give your offering every single week, God is going to open up the storehouses of heaven and bless you and you're going to have $70 million jets like them guys on TV. That's not the reality. The reality in the New Testament is some gave out of their wealth and others gave out of their poverty. We never see their situation changing. But what we do see is that the Bible says godliness with contentment is great gain. We give because we're content with the blessings that we have. God, you have already richly blessed me. Thank you for what you've given to me. In 2 Corinthians 9, 7, Scripture says, Each of you should give what you've decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. It's interesting that Paul tells the church, give in your heart what you've decided to give. He doesn't tell the church, hey, church, you need to give a percentage. Everyone's got to give a percentage. What we find in the New Testament is that there's some people who give a lot, and there's some people who give a little. There's some people who can't give much. There's some people who give 10%. There's some people who give much more than 10%. Some people are going through financial difficulties and cannot give 10%. The point is, what you are able to give, do it out of a sense of joy and not out of a sense of obligation. I've heard of some people who have joined churches where you have to provide an income statement so the staff can check to see if you're giving according to your income. Friends, I can let you know that won't happen here. Matter of fact, you will take great joy in knowing that the pastoral staff never sees the offering, never touches the offering, and never counts the offering. We have a counting team which counts the offering every week, and we have a financial secretary that records the information for your tax purposes. What you give is between you and God. And if you're giving because someone's going to be examining your income statement, you're not giving out of joy. You're giving out of obligation. Whatever God has laid on your heart to give, you do it cheerfully, knowing that God has already blessed you. Fifth, we expect members to be serving members. In our covenant, it says, I understand God has gifted me with various spiritual gifts, and I will seek out the opportunities to use my spiritual gifts within the body of Christ. Romans 12, verse 4, tells us that each of us has one body with many members, and those members don't have the same function. So in Christ, 
We, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to the other. Did y'all hear what it said? It says, you belong to the rest of the members. Now, that's going to mess with y'all a little bit. That means you don't belong just to yourself anymore. You belong to the church. When it says, husbands, your body does not belong to you, but belongs to your wife. Wife, your body does not belong to you, but belongs to your husband. Hey, I like that. In the same way, your body does not belong to you, but you belong to the other members. Because your gifts are given to you to be used in the context of blessing other people in the church. That means God has given you, every single person, every single person has a gift, a spiritual gift, to bless other people in the church. Some people have the gift of encouragement. Some people have the gift of administration. We have an incredible vacation Bible school director, April Lisk. She has the gift of administration. And she organizes everything, but she hates being in front of people. And so whenever it comes time for announcements, she's like, I can't do that, I'm scared to death. I mean, it scares me to death to think about managing all that stuff and all those kids, et cetera, et cetera, but that's her gift, and she uses it to serve the body. Some of you have the gift to wipe little babies' bottoms in the nursery. That's not my gift, brother. Some of you have that gift. You love it. You're like, oh, look at your little pee-pee. Some, some ladies have that gift. All right. Some of you men, y'all have a gift. You look like big gladiators. Serve on the security team. Praise God. Some have the gift of teaching. Teach. Some have the gift of, of, of giving. Do it with generosity. Some have the gift of encouragement. Do it. We have to be there. Last night I was talking to my son, Mayor, and I was telling him that one day he's going to grow up into a big man. He's two right now. And I said, Mayor, when you grow up into a big man, what are you going to do? He says, I'm going to ride your lawnmower. <laughs> I said, you can have a lawnmower one day when you get big. He says, no, I'm going to ride your lawnmower. <laughs> and we were talking about how he was small, and one day he's going to grow up to be big. And he said, Dad, when are you going to become small? I said, son, I won't become small again. Once you're small and you grow big, you stay big. But how many of ourselves see ourselves as big people, fully dependent on ourselves and not relying on other people? Maybe what we need to do is we need to stop worrying about growing big, but we need to start growing small and depend on one another. Maybe if you and I would grow small, we would see that I need you and I need you and I need you to help me in this Christian life. I can't do it myself. I can't do it on myself. I need the gifts that you have, and you need the gifts that they have, and they need the gifts that she has. When we grow small, we see that God has designed the rest of the body to function together. Lastly, we expect people to be a praying member. It says in our church covenant, I pledge to be a praying member who will uplift the various ministries of the church in prayer on a regular basis, including leaders, deacons, and pastors. If we will remember the scripture we read in Acts 2.42, it says they devoted themselves to prayer. The New American Standard says they continually devoted themselves to prayer. That means they were constantly praying for one another. As a member of the body of Christ, the responsibility of prayer falls on every single person. That means no one is immune from the privilege and the priority of prayer. There is no Christian unimportant enough that they could not and should not pray. That means whoever, someone here is the least, uh, ha has the least growth of a Christian. Let's say you've never been in Sunday school, you've never read your Bible, you've never... Uh, you don't know what's in the Old Testament, what's in the New Testament, but you believe in Christ. Maybe you got saved two weeks ago and you got baptized a few weeks ago. Someone is the least Christian in here, but when the least Christian prays, they automatically become an important Christian. See, no one is unimportant to the point where they can't pray. Every member is expected to pray. Apostle Paul asked the church in Ephesus, he said, pray for me that I would fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. And I would ask the same thing of you guys. Pray for me as your pastor. Pray that God would protect my heart and protect my mind and protect my spirit 
from an unending channel of distraction and warfare. Pray that God would give me wisdom to understand the word so that I might communicate it clearly. Pray for your Sunday school teachers. Pray for Pastor Robert. He's been with 17 teenagers for 11 days. Pray for him, brothers and sisters. Pray for his wife. Pray for my wife as she puts up with me. And she is God's partner that God has given me to do ministry. Pray for Pastor Dave as he leads in the worship music and as he counsels people and communicates with new people in our church. Pray for the nursery workers right now serving. Pray for the Awana workers and the children's church workers. Pray for the new converts and pray for the new members getting plugged into the body of Christ. And most of all, pray for other members who are going through a variety of trials and hardships that God would keep them strong in the midst of their suffering. Pray for one another. I want to encourage you to join us on Wednesday nights for our prayer meeting and Bible study. I want to encourage you to get plugged into a Sunday school class where you can pray for other people in that class. There has to be a degree of transparency where we come before other people and we say, this is what I'm struggling with. And if we're not doing that, then we're really being self-reliant and we're thinking that I can do this in my own strength. Friend, I'm going to go ahead and help you. You can't. You can't do it in your own strength. You have to have other brothers and sisters walking with you in that journey. So it's okay for me to tell you, you're not as good as you think you are. You're not as smart as you think you are. You're not as self-dependent as you think you are. You need others in this journey. It is the highest privilege on this side of heaven to be a part of God's kingdom. In His church. And remember... We are not saved by the church, but we are saved into the church. So, as we are going through this series, I ask you to consider, is the Lord calling me here? Is the Lord calling me to use my gifts here? If it's not here, that's okay. Find the place where God is calling you to get plugged into. And eventually, like my wife said, if you like it, you're going to have to put a ring on it. Maybe today's the day for you. Maybe today's the day where you join the covenant community of membership in this local church. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the body of Christ. I thank you that you are the one calling people, that you are the one adding people, that you are the one drawing.